I am here with Zach Williams, Robin Williams' son, and thank you so much for coming on and talking to me today. Um, we are first love. I think people know you from your father. Um, what was your relationship like with him? I mean, I had a great relationship with him as a son. We were very close friends. I think we spent a whole lot of time together. I was appreciating that um, I spent the final few years of his uh, life uh, nearby with him in the Bay Area. And so I was very thankful of that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, as a dad, he was awesome. Um, was very committed and very uh, passionate and being present and open when when he wasn't working, and so I'm I'm I was very grateful of the time we got to spend together. Oh, that's nice. I remember on uh, the HBO show, you said he was his um, the most successful person you know, and I know that was probably three years ago that aired, or maybe last. Do you feel still feel the same way? Nothing's changed. Huh. Huh. And what about you being a dad now? How old are you? Have a little, little infant, or yeah, my my son's five and a half months. His name's McLaurin. Uh, we call him Mickey. And uh, so far, so it's going great. He's very um, joyful and very smiley baby. Sleeps well, and he's uh, he's just a joy to be around. I mean, you know, most most babies are, but <laughs> I think. Uh, it's great to just be clear and 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 uh, consciously focused on being, you know, available and showing up as parents is something that my fiance and I are very keen on doing, and and so far it's going well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do you see your dad and yourself when you're parenting now? Do you see it sort of part of it coming out, like the playfulness of him or? In I, uh, I mean, I, I I'm not sure. It, it, it's hard to say because you know when I was a baby, I don't exactly remember how he was as a parent. I mean, I have videos and whatnot, and you know he was very present at the uh, uh, when when I was young, and and so I, I would say that you know we have the same goals. He had the similar goals as I have now in terms of showing up as a dad, for sure. Um, in terms of manifesting in similar ways, I, 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 I guess so. I mean, <laughs> sorry, odd question by me. Right. <laughs> um, so you know, diving into you know this having a mental health focus, and you've had. I, I look forward to hearing what sort of you're in the works with helping our mental health system and what project you have going on. Um, but you've publicly, and your father publicly had meant this mental health theme. So when you look now as an adult and what do you think was going on with your dad? I, I had the Lou body dementia and there was lots of reports saying that he was depressed throughout his life. And then there's drug use. Um, what are your thoughts on your dad's mental health? Well, I think what he was going through is the same story that many, many millions of people go through throughout the United States and you know, internationally. Um, he suffered from depression and anxiety. I share similar orientation. I suffer from depression, depressive episodes and and anxiety as well. It's all right. And then, uh, you know, uh, the Louis body de dementia diagnosis was postmortem. And I think a as a neurodegenerative disease, it certainly didn't help things. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, relative to that diagnosis, I, I, I think it was disruptive, certainly. Yeah. But, you know, his, his general mental health was something that he took care of, but it required, you know, consistent vigilance. I, I, I empathize with that because I have to do a similar thing to take care of myself. Yeah. Um, relative to substance use, um, that's something that he's talked about openly and he took measures to control. Um, it was 
consistent, uh, I don't want to say struggle, but it was something that ne he needed to be consistently vigilant, you know, feel similar in the sense that, you know, when it comes to depression, anxiety, it can be easy to medicate. And so uh, it's, it's important to be mindful of why we take the actions we do and what are, what we're seeking to alleviate and control. And, and so with respect to that, um, I, I feel that my father was very open about his struggles in some ways and in other ways, it was a private consideration that he talked about with his family and close friends, but didn't really share publicly. And so, you know, it was a, it was a mix. Um, and ultimately, um, it was a lifelong ordeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting as an outsider looking at it because it seemed like he went to therapy. He tr was aware of it. He had the means to go to therapists and still there is that you know, it's almost like as an outsider, again, you could feel the pain going, he has access. He, he almost, you know, he's so open and vulnerable about it. Like so the stigma didn't kind of wiped away. So it's like, oh, it just felt, you know, painful. Like, oh, we couldn't help. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm just kind of putting that out there as, as an outsider, that feeling. Uh, do you think there could have been something that could have helped him more? I, you know, I think there's the, the cultural stigma component. I think having a society that that is more open and and able to have dialogues around issues associated with mental health, I think that's one component. Um, you know, relative to his suicide, it was um, it, it was a it was a confluence in a kind of a perfect storm of the situation that I think made his personal situation very challenging, both with the neurogenerative disease diagnosis, the depression, the, you know, what was taken in terms of medication. That's all very disruptive. Yeah. You know, especially if you're, if you're, you're talking about dealing with multiple issues at the same time. And so, um such a good point because of the parkinson's drugs too what how, what role did that play I, it's hard to say you, you know when you're talking about additional variables added it, it creates a very complex environment and you know the the, the brain is a very fine-tuned evolved organ and mm -hmm. when you're talking about adding several different inputs it, it can create um a, you know, as I said, kind of disruption. And, yes. yeah. and, and so, you know, were there ways to save him? I mean, it, it would be conjecture and, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty around this. I, I, I think, you know, more of an openness, destigmatizing de the conversation and also encouraging more connectedness and community uh, certainly would have probably helped him, I, I think, just as it helps other people who are struggling. Um, it, you know, it's, but it's hard to say. Yeah, it is. But I appreciate it. I mean, you're doing it in action right now. I mean, for us, you and me talking about it is part of hopefully, you know, getting more of these conversations out there. We're doing that. So, in that sense, what has it been like for you to grieve publicly? Uh, it's hard. <laughs> it's It's been a, something that I've consistently had to do. And, and there's times when I've exhausted myself uh, when it comes to kind of being there for others and not, not being considerate of my own self-care and what I've needed to handle my personal issues. Um, so it, it, it's it it's an ongoing thing it's it's something that in in many ways is heartening to to see how much of an impact he 
personality and and uh, legacy. So my my take is it's something that you know I've been open to doing when it comes to talking about my personal struggles with it and and that 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 boundary between public and private it gets blended sometimes but I'm trying to be better about knowing what I can keep for myself and hold personally and with my close friends and family and what we can, what, what I can talk about publicly and, and, you know, in terms of the shared experience and, and talking about my father as a man and mm-hmm. his, uh, his personal ordeals. Yeah. I could imagine that's a struggle. It's like you inherited this public being public about it it was um and finding that boundary because i can see just even by your willingness to do this interview you are giving that gift to being open about it at the same time how much do you keep private um what how does it let's see here how do you feel it being a suicide at the suicide made the grief differently or did it make it different? Does the suicide change? I feel like every time there's someone passes, at least in my life, each grief has been different. The relationship's been different. Um, my experience afterwards is different. Did the suicide play a role in your grieving? Um, well, I, I think it would be considered a traumatic event. Okay. It was sudden and it wasn't expected. Yeah. Um, I don't want to speak for people who are dealing with loved ones with terminal illnesses or accidents, et cetera. But, you know, this, this had a lot of trauma associated with it. And so uh, unwinding and dealing with the trauma associated with that suicide is, is something that I think is specific to, the act and the 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 results of taking one's own life so i mean yeah there was direct direct issues associated with the suicide for sure yeah yeah is there anything i mean again tell me if i go too far here of is there anything that you wish you could have told him there beforehand or um angry about committing suicide were you does that make sense if if there's things i wish i could have told him yeah i mean it's yeah i mean always always it's important to share the love you have for someone Mm -hmm. you know there was a some anger certainly um but at the end of the day I'm learning how to be at peace with how things turned out um, and to put to rest the resentments and be grateful for the time we did have is something that I'm becoming more and more comfortable with. Mm, That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. I mean, you feel like you've been through a lot of deliberate thought around this and I applaud you with that. Um, you know, often we can just shove our feelings away, you know, drinking or put them, be busy. Um, so for what it's worth, you know, I'm just meeting you, but that's powerful. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who is a loved one has committed suicide? The advice I would give to someone who has dealt with a loved one who has committed suicide. Take time to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Essential in the grieving process. As a people pleaser, I did not take the time initially to take care of myself and I, and I exhausted myself as a result. And, and then I was just unable to give and I was unable to devote time to self care in the way that I needed and, and, it led to a breakdown. And so, uh, so I'd say 
prioritize self-care, prioritize taking time to support oneself prior to showing up for others. It, it's really important. I can't emphasize that enough because some people, certain people have orientation to just care for others, be there for others. And when they neglect themselves, there can be, there can be direct results, sometimes catastrophic, sometimes uh, less so, that result from not devoting time and effort to self-care. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. It's true. And no one else is going to take care of yourself. You know, I mean, people will try, but there's some work that just has to be done, you know, with ourselves. Um, I like that advice. What about grieving in general? Do you have any um, thoughts? And especially since you did this publicly, um, a lot of the grief, do you have any advice for someone who's grieving? Uh, my advice for people who's grieving is there's no right way to do it. You know, do it in a way that feels genuine and honest to who you are. Huh. You know, don't, don't feel like you have to share or not share or something. It's, 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 it's can be stigmatized in certain cultures. So I, I need to call it spade a spade. Yeah. Cer certain, certain, times it, it can be uh uh considered you know not the right time to grieve and things like that and i say you know each personal situation is different but i would say find the path that's true to you and try to try to try to grieve in the way that feels right and it's different for every person. Yeah, it's so beautiful. It is so, it, but it's true, right? It's, it's, um, each life is different. Each way we look at it is different in our own process. And um, I like how you talked about the different cultures have it differently. Um, I'm a big fan of, it sounds strange, but I'm a big fan of funerals in the sense that it is a ritual. We come together. We have this moment. It's a collective emotional experience. And we don't have as many of those with death. Um, we don't have people walking around black, you know, widows black for 30 days. Um, we, you know, it's kind of, we have this 10 day process and then it's, you're away. And often I find that grief is six months or a year later and somebody's, that's when it really hits oh, you're not there for this moment in my life or I wish I could share this with them. Um, so are there th certain things that trigger you to your dad? Like moments of popping in the ocean or light switches flickering? Are there little moments that make you think of him? Uh, sure. I, I, I think the, the moments that trigger memories of my dad, you know, often it involves spending time with my son. Um, also when you see the, what's going on on kind of the geopolitical stage, I think that he would have, uh, had a field day. I wish he was around for that. That would be just great. He would have impact. He'd have a big impact. Yes. Yes. Sorry to interrupt your process. I just got excited. I wish he was here too. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, so, so, yeah, those those two things specifically elicit memories of him for sure. Uh, you know, I miss him. We miss him as a family. Uh, we're a joke. If I could switch gears just a little bit, but it might still be in the same realm. When you think about the last, you know, your father when he was alive, and then his time here afterwards is there anything that you wish the public would understand that maybe they don't or you just wish they understood um maybe about him or mental health um is there something i wish the public would understand about my dad or mental health in general 
Yeah. Certainly. I feel that often for entertainers, what they display in terms of their public persona is, does not indicate what they are going through privately. Oh. And each person struggles differently and what they show, what they indicate, what they share on social media, et cetera, might not necessarily be how they're personally dealing with and coping with day-to-day -day life. And so I think having empathy for people in general and, and trying to understand that their personal journey might not be what they're projecting out mm -hmm. is, is something that I think we could all benefit from. Yes. Yeah. Um, in terms of mental health, I mean, everybody struggles at some point in their life. And it's just something that we need to be more open and consistent in talking about because that ultimately leads to a safer, more considerate society, mm -hmm. plain and simple. Yes, yes. It's beautiful, those two points of, you know, we often see just the movie trailer of whoever the performer is or whoever the, so, you know, social media. It's just the clips. It's the highlights uh, or what we want to see, that branding. Um, and it's true. We all have the mental health behind us, the neurodiversity and respecting that diversity among us. And, I, you know, when I come back to what is the answer, you know, obviously I don't have the answer but compassion and empathy has to be in there for me of just pull, pulling down that guard and we're just two people all the time whoever we meet it's just another person and they're in pain they have their insecurities and um yeah i think it speaks to it um so that being said tell me what's going on with you on the mental health and i mean you're already by doing this you're an advocate talking in the public um, tell me about this organization that you were at Manny's for. Well, I, I, I went to speak at Manny's to support supervisors Hillary Ronan and Matt Haney around their Mental Health SF initiative. Um, and supporting that are or supporting the cause are several organizations I'm involved with, specifically the cause of mental health support. <laughs> yes. Um, so aside from advocating for Mental Health SF, I am involved with an organization called Bring Change to Mind, yeah. which is uh, a awareness and programming organization focused on developing media and peer-to-peer -peer resources for high school students. Mm -hmm. um, and that organization was started 10 years ago by Glenn Close, the actor. Mm -hmm. um, and since that time, it's, it's now in hundreds of high schools throughout the U.S. and the goal is to scale nationally in terms of having the programs available to any high school organization that should want it mm -hmm. uh, or high school institution, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I've been involved with that organization for almost four years. Wow, fantastic. They're doing great work. And I plan on, I'm also involved with an organization called United for Global Mental Health, which is a global advocacy organization also focused on, on supporting and, and advocating for pragmatic policy around mental health and mental health care reform. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, so that organization is new and it's very exciting, the work they're doing. Um, coinciding with that is my involvement with an organization called MindAid, which is creating a... Um, a event and media platform to engage with young people around mental health and then proceeds from that will be supporting uh, best in class mental health organizations throughout the US and abroad. Oh, that's fantastic. I absolutely, every, every single one of these is great. You're hitting the right where Glenn Close is 
organization just you know gets it right into the high school peer to peer work which is so powerful um and then the policy part cuz oh, man there's so much we could do with all these little organizations but when the policy changes i think it's such a big impact um I love this. This is just really exciting. <laughs> I, I didn't know all this was under your, you know, agenda. Um, uh, can we multiply you, clone you, <laughs> put you out into the world? <laughs> well, just like your dad, you're doing a big impact. I'm, uh, I'm just like me, but, but <laughs> I, I definitely seek to honor his legacy and doing some stuff I do. And aside from, from that, um, the, uh, the work that he's done certainly has influenced me in terms of how I think about service and, and living life to, the, to its fullest and, you know, giving back and, and supporting causes that benefit people on a whole is something that is very near and dear to my heart, my family's heart, and is dear to, you know, my father and his legacy. Yeah. So you know, we're doing what we can. Yeah, that's great. What would you advise somebody who is, um, you know, watching this, what could they do to play a role? Because I get a lot of um, notes to me, hey, how can I help? I don't have a ton of money. How do I play a role to support mental health? I'm overcoming this. What, would, what advice would you give somebody? Find your local organizations. I mean, there's so many, there's a myriad of different ways to be involved. Um, Google is a great resource. Google mental health resources, mental health communities in your region, in your area. I mean, you can certainly volunteer for a number of top tier organizations. Mm -hmm. NAMI, um, which is, I hope I get this acronym right, the National Association of Mental Illness. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, crisis text line, there's, you know, of course there's bring change to mind and whatnot, but, but that's not involved. It's involved in several regions in the U S but it's not deployed nationally in every state. Mm -hmm. So the key thing is, is, is knowing what your local organizations are. If you want to volunteer directly, spending time one-on-one -on -one with people, Spending time in communities, supporting the cause is, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Finding opportunities to connect rather than isolate, especially if you're struggling or going through personal issues, I, I find is a, is a great way to start laying a foundation for healing and restoring one's, one's own kind of better baseline. Yeah. That community so, part, yeah, how we can change that is such a big impact. I mean, we have a loneliness epidemic right now. And yeah. it's, you know, everything from the way our suburbs making us more lonely is, is our work. Oh, yeah, there's so many factors. And um, yeah, when we can just be there for somebody, I feel that is impactable impact impactable is that a word impactable sure. thanks for running with it it has a huge impact on somebody when i think of the people who have really influenced me the most are the people who've made time for me um and that's yeah we can do that we all have 10 minutes and um do that for another person um so maybe this is a bizarre question yeah. and i know it's a selfish one but going on the mental health kind of train of who, if I was to interview somebody else and you could tag them, like kind of like a tag game, who would you think would be a great person for me to interview and getting some insight on mental health out there in the world? Uh, great, great people I would recommend to speak with would be Jazz Thornton, who's a mental health advocate. Mm -hmm. based out of New Zealand, huh. okay. but she's spending a lot more time in the United States. Huh. Her work is amazing. She's also a filmmaker. Huh. Fantastic. And then Kevin Hines, who's a filmmaker, who's very involved with um, mental health, mental health advocacy, but he, his work uh, relates to suicide survivors, also 
supporting people who are dealing with great trauma and, and coping with grief. Um, so Jazz and Kevin are two people I'd highly recommend speaking with. Oh, okay. Those are great. I've never heard of either one and I've got some homework to do. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Um, Zach, I just appreciate your time and doing this and your openness and then your work that you're doing, even with a newborn. Um, I hope that people who like yourself are open like this can have an impact. There might be just a little nugget or a big part of it that someone can relate to and um, keep it flowing and a modeling for other people to say, Hey, you know, I'm going through this and let's talk about it and we can be vulnerable. And um, so I just really appreciate it. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, for those who are watching this, I will put all those contacts of the organizations that you're working with. Um, if they're available, I will put them in the notes. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure thing.